Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on congenital infections associated with congenital anomalies in Sub-Saharan Africa. This webinar is brought to you by the Sub-Saharan Congenital Anomalies Network, SCAN, and the Global Health Network, University of Oxford. We're really excited to have you join this webinar. Thank you for keeping time, those who've been able to join on time. And I think we'll get started. As we know, in uterine exposure to certain infections is an important cause of non-genetic congenital disorders. Depending on the teratogen and timing of infection, such exposure can result in anatomical malformations. And we'll be hearing more about the different infections from our experts and our speakers about their association with congenital anomalies. Before we start, I'd like to do some housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Sub-Saharan African Congenital Anomalies Network Knowledge Hub. It is also important to note that we translate the speech and to subtitles in your chosen language. And if you'd like to navigate to the closed caption function and select your language, you'll be able to hear the speakers in your own language. Closed caption, you can see the circles below in the bottom section of your screen. Please use the chat function to introduce yourself or for any technical issues. Please use the Q&A function to post your questions and topics. You can also post anony anonymously. Due to the number of participants, your camera and microphone are disabled. However, there's an opportunity at the end for a Q&A session to speak to the panel. Please raise your hand and we will enable your microphone so you can ask your question directly. However, the panelists will also be able to respond to your question in the chat. So I think we get started. It's really exciting. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear the panel and the agenda. I will be chairing. My name's are Professor Philip Amsoke from Makere University. Muju Research Collaboration. We also have a uh, congenital Zika virus from 2015 to 2024, presented by Professor Fasina, Fasini. There's gestational congenital syphilis infection by Dr. Kufa Hacheza. We also have prevalence and associated factors of congenital syphilis among newborns in Mbarara in Uganda. Associate Professor Mwanga Amumpaide. And then uh, finally, we have surveillance for rubella and congenital rubella syndrome, a perspective from the National Institute of Communicable Diseases by Dr. Kerrigan MacArthur. So we'll now move, and then there'll be a QA and a uh, at the end of the presentation. So please hold your questions until the end. So our first presentation, we're really excited that we have uh, registered interest from all over the world. I think you can see your numbers, which country you come from, and uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, but also from South Latin America and from Asia. It's really exciting. And thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar. So our first speaker is going to be Professor Lavina Shula Fashina. She's a professor of medical genetics at Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and Hospital do Clinico de Porte Alegre, who is interested in the genetic and environmental risk factors underpinning human congenital anomalies. She's one of the founders and the coordinator of the Brazilian Teratogen Information Service. Professor Fassini has studied the teratogenic effects of various medications, including mer merosoprosol, thalidomide, rubella vaccine, H1N1 virus, and other environmental chemicals. She was involved with Brasilia, Brazil's 2015 to 2016 Zika virus epidemic 
as a medical geneticist and the president of the Brazilian Society of Medical Genetics. She's a consultant for the Minister of Health for Congenital Anomalies. And we're really excited to hear from you, Professor. Over to you, you're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to share my presentation now. And I want to thank you first, uh, all of you that are uh, watching this webinar and uh, all those invited me. So here is uh, just, an, oh, sorry, uh, just to have a look. Uh, this is where I, I live, Porto Alegre, South Brazil, my hospital and the research team. Um, just to uh, give you um, a, a brief uh, introduction, um, we have in 2015 an outbreak of microcephaly in Northeast Brazil, and that led to uh, discover or to identify a new teratogen in humans, which was the Zika virus. And in 2016, it was possible also to um, define the congenital uh, Zika syndrome, which was characterized, the microcephaly was a secondary event of this brain disruption or the brain destruction of, by the virus associated with neurological outcomes uh, like epilepsy, um, hypertonicity, and the arthrogryposis, poses, which means children cannot move the, the joints because secondary to this neurological uh, affection. And uh, also some sensorial neural uh, problems in uh, ocular and um, uh, also hearing as well. So you can see here, we can uh, we see these images of this skull which is collapsed because of the destruction of the brain. You cannot, it, it's difficult to see here even the um, contents of the, the brain. And secondary, you have also these uh, skin folds, which means the brain stopped to grow and uh, collapsed. And then we have also the skin folds. Okay, uh, what we are going to discuss in the next uh, few minutes, um, what is the whole spect spectrum of congenital Zika syndrome? What are, are the risks for uh, the embryo or fetus exposed? Uh, what is the development uh, in the long range? What happened to these children now in 2024? <laughs> Rates of mortality and morbidity. And what happened to those who were exposed intrauterine but were born without microcephaly? So these are the main questions for today. Uh, we have some challenges studying Zika virus, which means the lab tests are still today subjected to some uncertainties. It's difficult to confirm the exposure since there are many cross reactions to other flavivirus. And uh, that means that uh, we don't have the, 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 the certainty of the exposure. Uh, also, many times maternal symptoms, Zika uh, fever is sometimes very mild. So there are many women that didn't realize that they had uh, Zika, uh, uh, Zika uh, uh, fever. And uh, they realized later because the baby was born with some congenital anomalies. So it's difficult to know who exactly was exposed or no exposed. So uh, we, I'm presenting now uh, a paper we published last, uh, last um, year and uh, with a cohort, with 13 cohorts from the Brazilian, Zika Brazilian Cohorts Consortium with uh, more than 1,000 pregnancies with confirmed exposure followed. So what we have uh, as a main results, um, 
miscarriage and stillbirths is low, less than 1%. But I have to tell you that in Brazil, uh, pregnancy interruption is not allowed. So the information about miscarriage and stillbirth is very complicated because uh, women don't tell you exactly what happened uh, when they uh, lose a pregnancy, okay? But preterm was 10%, low birth weight, 7%, and small for gestational age, uh, more than 15%. Uh, Here is the most interesting thing. Uh, microcephaly at birth was 2.5%, uh, 2.6%. But anytime if we follow later, these children go to 4% um, uh, mean of um, microcephaly. Severe microcephaly, low than uh, 3Z scores, was 0.3% to 1.3% 1, 1 uh, if you follow. Uh, most important are that some children born without microcephaly had neuroimaging abnormalities like calcifications and alteration in the pattern of the gray matter. It, that goes for 88%. And um, functional abnormalities up to 18 to 20% and also visual or ophthalmological abnormalities in 4%. So the overall risk, if you take all these pregnancies uh, for babies exposed intrauterine to uh, Zika virus in different periods of the pregnancy goes to uh, 25%. But this risk is much higher during the first trimester and goes uh, lower 2% or to 1 to 0.5% in the second and third trimester. So the main risk is first trimester. What do you know about other studies in other parts of the world? Uh, this is now a consensus that the overall prevalence of microcephaly is around 5%, okay? So from different countries. And the overall risk, considering children born with different uh, kinds of not only microcephaly, but other brain abnormalities, it goes from 15 to almost 30%. In uh, this, um, I, I put here is uh, small to see, but different uh, cohorts in different countries, the majority in uh, the Americas, especially Latin American and Caribbean. And what happened to children that was born uh, without uh, microcephaly? And what we know now is that the brain image is a good predictor of uh, having a neurological or cognitive delay uh, during the later years. So uh, if we have any abnormal image uh, or neurological abnormality at birth, we can predict the long-term uh, term follow-up, which means that children born exposed but without image abnormality nor neurological uh, alterations at birth, the majority uh, the of the studies now show no difference between those exposed and non-exposed, okay? So important message, a child born with uh, Zika exposure during pregnancy, but without, with a normal image, and a neurological normal at birth, it's a good predictor for follow-up. So I put here just two papers published this year in 24. So it's children more than seven years old now and another from Brazil and the same. Uh, they don't have, they don't find significant differences. Here is one from Colombia uh, that shows that they 
might not have neurological alterations, but they, they found significant differences in behavior, mood, and um, other uh, psychiatric uh, alterations. So it's something that you need to look with more uh, detail. Uh, just to, to finish my presentation, um, I'm showing uh, our group of uh, researchers, and we are working in genetic mechanisms uh, related to the pathogenesis of Zika syndrome. So teratogenesis is a multifactorial event. So uh, how are the mechanisms, uh, genetic mechanisms, that can be involved, molecular mechanisms involved in the teratogenesis. So we are working in genes. We know that congenital infections, they don't are mutagenic. They don't uh, produce mutations, but they interfere with the normal function of the genes, the regulation and expression of the genes. So we are working on that and showing interesting pathways that can be disrupted by the Zika virus. Why is this important? It's important because you can predict in cases of other infections, newer infections, or even ways to treat the potential consequences of the infections in the brain development. And we are also working with um, Animal models, especially in, uh, especially in chicken, chicken is easy and uh, less complicated and um, to to uh, study these outcomes. So the last uh, question is: Zika now is endemic, but we still have uh, some cases in different countries. So it's not that Zika disappeared; Zika became endemic, and we have new cases every year. So Zika has not gone away. And perhaps the most um, worried now is that due to the climate change, we are uh, observing that the vectors are adapting to different uh, climates, as well as the virus is adapting uh, itself to new vectors. So, uh, this is from last year, but Paris now is uh, <laughs> on the scene because of the Olympic Games. And uh, there is a, this uh, uh, worry about the spread of these tropical diseases and congenital infections to other countries. So thank you so much. Obrigada in Portuguese. This is our Teratogen Information Service and our team and Teresa and I, the founders many years ago. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Pacini, for that excellent overview about Zika virus and other congenital infections. I think it's important, as you've mentioned, to keep a lookout for what may seem asymptomatic disease, but actually there are other underlying problems that the children may have. So excellent. Thank you so much. I want to ask the other participants to write their Q&A in the chat or in the question and answer section so that when the time comes, your questions can be uh, answered. Thank you very much. So I want to thank uh, Professor Fugini. And we're moving on to our next presentation. We all know syphilis has become a major problem in the world globally. And I think it's important that we're discussing syphilis again. It's an old disease, but it's become a new problem. And our presentation is on gestational and congenital syphilis infection. Our presenter will be Dr. Tendesei Pufa Kacheza. She's a senior epidemiologist for Center for HIV and STIs, National Institute for Communicable Diseases, and University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. Dr. Kufa Kachesa is a medical doctor with postgraduate training in public health and epidemiology. She is currently a senior epidemiologist at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases Center for HIV and STIs. In this role, she designs and implements HIV and STI surveillance 
and research activities and mentors junior staff. She oversees the Enhanced Congenital Syphilis Case Surveillance Program implemented in collaboration with the Notifiable Medical Conditions Program at NICD. She's an honorary senior lecturer in the University of Witwatersrand School of Public Health and has supervised masters and doctoral students. She has served on the SANAC task team on strategic information, the NDOH technical working group on STIs, and the WHO technical working group on HIV surveillance using routine data. We're really excited to have her with us, Dr. Kufa Kacheza. You're welcome for your presentation on congenital syphilis. Over to Thank you, you Philippa. And um, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to give this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, gestational syphilis, which is essentially uh, syphilis occurring in pregnant women. And then I'll talk about uh, congenital syphilis later on, and then just give a global picture of uh, the epidemiology and then an overview of uh, what those conditions are, the clinical features, and then we'll talk about challenges in tracking elimination. So we all know, uh, I hope, that uh, congenital syphilis is a preventable um, public health problem which happens when someone who's pregnant acquires syphilis or falls pregnant while they already have syphilis and it remains undetected, untreated or inadequately treated for the duration of the pregnancy, resulting in pregnancy losses, uh, so miscarriages, stillbirths, uh, preterm or low weight, birth weight babies and congenital infection. Uh, in our settings where you have high HIV prevalence, we know that having HIV and syphilis together in pregnant women increases the risk of vertical transmission of HIV. So it is important that we track syphilis and we uh, we prevent it. Um, we track syphilis in pregnancy and prevent it uh, from being transmitted from mother to child. So as I was saying, it is a, a global public health problem and the WHO recognizes this. And since 2007, there's been an initiative to eliminate congenital syphilis um, and under this plan, the global plan for the elimination of congenital syphilis, now it's been paired with um, HIV and hepatitis B. Um, it requires that countries implement a set of measures, which we're going to talk about, but essentially ensure that pregnant women book for antenatal care as early as possible, that they are screened for syphilis, treated if they are found to be positive, and then the baby is evaluated at birth. Uh, and there are a number of uh, process and impact criteria that countries have to meet in order to be validated as having eliminated congenital syphilis. So in terms of uh, impact criteria, countries should report, and that is in the presence of a robust uh, a surveillance system, uh, 50 cases of congenital syphilis per 100,000 live births, and in terms of process criteria, almost 100%, which is 95% of pregnant women receive antenatal care, 95% get tested, and 95% of those that are pos positive get treated. So the occurrence of syphilis in, in pregnancy is very similar to uh, syphilis occurring in any other individual. And how it presents in pregnancy depends also on the stage of infection and the natural history of the disease. So from primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, late, early latent, late latent, and then tertiary syphilis. But most pregnant women are asymptomatic, and that's why... Uh, screening and testing during pregnancy is the cornerstone of the global plan to eliminate congenital syphilis. Women may have an ulcer during pregnancy, and that requires midwives and anyone looking after pregnant women to check for signs and symptoms of genital ulcers um, or the skin rash um, and other features that are characteristic of the secondary stage. But as I said earlier on, the majority of women are asymptomatic and it will only be picked up. Uh, through administering a test. As I was, yeah, so that's the point I was making in my earlier slide that, you know, screening and, and treatment of mothers for syphilis is really simple and inexpensive, and it has been found to be cost-effective in a whole variety of settings, including low-income countries like, like we are, low- and middle-income countries like we are. The WHO recommends booking, uh, testing for syphilis at the first antenatal care visit, that's at the booking visit, um, which should ideally happen before 20 weeks. 
and to use rapid tests when they are available, if there is a, a quality assured rapid test, preferably a dual rapid HIV and uh, syphilis test, a dual HIV syphilis test that is rapid and quality assured, that is what they recommend. Um, in the if they're not those are not available or you people have access to the lab then the lab testing can also be done and we uh, and the, the guidelines encourage testing with both a specific and a non-specific test to confirm and to also monitor so we use the our non-specific or non-triponemal test to also measure progress um or, of or the impact of treatment CDC guidelines in the U.S., they recommend retesting uh, in the third trimester. Uh, our own here in South Africa, our guidelines recommend, used to recommend testing uh, 32 to 34 weeks, but because of um, um, increasing number of cases and analysis of gaps or missed opportunities uh, that women were not always getting the repeat test um, and that there were women that were acquiring syphilis during the course of the pregnancy after the initial test was negative. We've decided to screen more often and now we screen four times um, at the same time as we screen for HIV. So at the booking, at two other time points and at delivery. Um, so benzathine penicillin remains the um, the cornerstone of treating syphilis in mums who test positive for syphilis. Syphilis, ideally, it should be given um, on the same day as the test is positive, but within 14 days of a positive result, because we don't always know what stage the syphilis is, is because most women are symptomatic. Uh, WHO recommends that uh, women be treated with 2.4 million units intramuscular doses of benzathine penicillin, uh, and it's effective in preventing adverse birth outcomes because it crosses the placenta well. Other treatments don't do this very well, and there is actually no um, proven alternative. There are uh, papers that have re reported using keftriaxone, amoxicillin, and other drugs, but uh, benzathine penicillin, as far as possible, is the recommended treatment for pregnant women with syphilis. If there is a penicillin allergy, they recommend desensitization and still giving benzathine penicillin. Importantly, partner notification among women that are positive and to promote consistent condom use. And partner notification is needed so that women don't get reinfected um, in, the, in that current pregnancy and in future pregnancies. So how big of a problem is this issue of uh, vertical transmission of syphilis, um, which then gives rise to congenital syphilis? So in 2016, uh, in 2019, um, this paper was published, but was reporting a modeling exercise using data up to 2016. And they reported that the global prevalence of maternal syphilis or gestational syphilis was about 0.7%. And that um, was equivalent to 661,000, um, gave rise to 661,000 cases of uh, mother-to-child transmission of syphilis. Um, and the breakdown of those cases were 355,000 adverse birth outcomes and 306,000 asymptomatic infants born to untreated mothers. And the reasons for why those adverse birth outcomes occurred was that in 50%, 57% of the cases, um, women had attended antenatal care but had not been tested. Um, in 21%, mothers had uh, not attended antenatal care. In 16%, mothers had attended uh, and were screened but were not treated. And only in 6%, moms had um, enrolled, were screened and treated, but perhaps the treatment was not adequate. So as you can see, the biggest missed opportunity is women not attending antenatal care at all and attending but not being tested. So hence the drive to make sure that women are tested and treated. So this is, this is a very busy table and I'm not expecting anyone to go through all these numbers, but the idea here was just to look at the global epidemiology of vertical transmission of syphilis. And I divided that into the prevalence of gestational syphilis and then the occurrence of the congenital syphilis itself. And so the point here is that although 
Africa hasn't reported the, the increases that have been seen in other uh, high-income countries, we still bear the brunt of the largest cases of congenital syphilis. So we account for 60% of the global burden of congenital syphilis um, in 2016. And our case rate was estimated then to be about 1,119 um, cases per live beds. And everywhere else in the world, the case rate is lower and the screening rates are higher. So although, and I'll show you in the next slide that our, our antenatal care coverage was, was lower, uh, and that our epidemiology, our, we're not reporting those increases that are being seen in other countries. It might just be an issue of the data because we don't have good data. Um, we don't have good surveillance systems uh, to track maternal syphilis and um, and congenital syphilis. Um, yes, yeah, so our, as I was saying that these are examples of countries that have uh, reported large increases in congenital syphilis. And you see the US reported last year that they did a 10 times increase in the number of cases since 2012, um, between 2012 and 2022, but they're coming from a low base. Uh, Canada as well has reported large increases in maternal syphilis and correspondingly to uh, congenital syphilis as well. The, the green bars here are from our surveillance here at the NICD in Johannesburg for South Africa. And we can see that the bars are RPR positive infants tested and, and, and the data made available from the lab. And the green line is the clinical cases notified by providers. So the, the, the trajectory is increased. And then Australia, the UK, Brazil and Peru are some of the other countries that have reported increases as well. So the, the sentiment is that uh, syphilis um, is trans transmission is up in most countries in the world. Pregnant women are not spared. And depending on how well screening and test testing and treatment happens in pregnancy, we will start to see increases in, in congenital syphilis cases. So what are the gaps and challenges in maternal testing and treatment? Um, there are many, um, and I've listed risk factors that have come up. In the past, the overriding factor was women not attending antenatal care. In most places, women do attend antenatal care now. They may attend late, so have a booking in the third trimester, and there's not enough time to test and treat the baby before they are born. Um, but in the U.S. looked at their data uh, in 2023 and reported that in 88% of the cases, women had um, attended antenatal care, but they had not been tested. So in other words, providers not thinking about it or not having a high index of suspicion for, for syphilis and therefore not testing. And in other countries um, where testing is is, is available and treatment is available. These are some of the risk factors that have been associated with the occurrence of uh, mother to child transmission of syphilis, younger maternal age, people who belong to ethnic minorities, substance use, poor access, which drives not booking or late booking, women who are unmarried or cohabiting, late diagnosis of the syphilis, women presenting in primary syphilis and having high titers. And so all of these factors um, do increase the risk of having a child with congenital syphilis. So when we haven't tested and treated the moms well, the outcome is infection in the child. Um, and just to point out that uh, infants can be asymptomatic. In fact, the majority of infants are asymptomatic at birth, which means um, any child that is exposed, born to a mother who has syphilis, whether it's treated or untreated, needs to be monitored and followed up um, at least for a year uh, to see if they don't develop signs and symptoms. Um, but when it does become symptomatic, um, which is um, in the minority of children, it can present with signs and symptoms affecting all the systems. So they may have jaundice, edema, lymphadenopathy, they can have a pneumonia, in respiratory distress, and then they'll have the rash that people know about, hepatosplenomegaly, ascites, and then they have uh, features on x-ray that can be used for diagnosis, 
in the hematological system, they may have anemia and, and low platelets, and they can have neurological signs and symptoms, which is very important because if it's not treated or it's, it's missed, then these children will have long-term cognitive deficits if they are not attended to in infancy. And then it can also cause blindness and deafness in children. So making a diagnosis of congenital syphilis is based on a combination of uh, signs and symptoms in the maternal history of either not being treated or not being treated adequately uh, or, or acquiring syphilis later on. And sometimes infants are picked up later on when they present with clinical signs and symptoms when the, and the maternal history is negative so that they were tested and they were negative. Um, so if there are, if, if infants have signs and symptoms that are consistent with congenital syphilis, regardless of, of what the maternal history says, those infants should be investigated for for congenital syphilis and and treated accordingly uh, according to the results so there are a number of lab tests that can be done um, csf as well can be used um, um, a, a non-specific test a vdri on csf can be used to determine if a child has congenital syphilis and then of course the x-ray features that we spoke about and treatment, again, benzathine penicillin is the mainstay of treating infants. And how much to give and how long depends on whether the child is symptomatic or asymptomatic at birth. If they are symptomatic, this is usually the child that gets referred to hospital, is given intravenous uh, uh, penicillin, or is given IM, but uh, for, for longer duration of 10 days. And then if they are asymptomatic, they get a start dose. Um, and then in addition to specific treatment with benzathine penicillin, um, these children should also get general supporting measures that are dependent on what the um, presenting features are. If they are hypothermic, then we need to keep them warm. They need to be hydrated and fed and to monitor renal and hepatic function. Oxygen therapy, if they have pneumonia, they may need a transfusion if they have anemia because they're generally very ill children. And we'll see that in our surveillance, a lot of children are notified from the hospital. Um, and just to reiterate what I was saying earlier on about follow-up of syphilis exposed or treated infants, um, these are children that then need to be followed up um, every three at three months and then with repeat testing until the titers drop to less than fourfold what they were. Um, when I was looking up literature, there's not a lot of data on longer term follow up of children that have congenital syphilis. Um, a few papers in the con context of maybe hearing loss or other congenital anomaly, no, anomalies report courts of children that had congenital syphilis. So this is an area that needs to be looked at. What are the long term impacts of, uh, of being exposed or being treated for congenital syphilis among infants? Um, so this slide is just showing uh, characteristics of infants that were notified to our system between July and September last year. Um, and you will see that um, we uh, our notifications are suboptimal and that there is missing data. So important pieces of information are not always available. So this data set had 429 infants for that period. And you see that almost half or less than half of the children didn't have other information on um, uh, maternal information or, or other PRs and things like this. But I just wanted to highlight that um, a few things that most of them are term. Uh, so preterm is not very common. So about a quarter or just over a quarter of the infants um, were born before 37 weeks. Low birth weight was also common. Um, and most of them were RPR positive, a few with very high titers, which means these are the infants that you want to follow and make sure. But the majority of them were asymptomatic with just 28.2% having one or more signs and symptoms um, to 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 speak about, but they met the WHO definition or the WHO criteria for congenital syphilis, which is very broad, by the way. So um, the point here is that these infants may be asymptomatic. The majority of them are asymptomatic and need to be followed up. 
Um, so one of the things, one of the cornerstones or the pillars of the global plan is having robust surveillance systems that are able to track what is happening. Uh, so in many countries, congenital syphilis and or maternal syphilis are notifiable. I know in Brazil, uh, providers report both maternal syphilis and, and congenital syphilis cases. In South Africa here, uh, a category, um, congenital syphilis is a category two NMC, notifiable medical condition, which means providers are required to notify within cases within seven days of making a diagnosis. And the reporting is case-based. So the providers see a case, they complete a form online or do a paper one and send it to the notification program or the notification to the surveillance system. And this data is necessary, it's invaluable to be able to track the impact of the prevention, care and treatment measures that we have in place. Without data, we cannot quantify how big a problem it is and we cannot see the impact of the interventions that we're putting in place. So what are some of the challenges that we are, are seeing in tracking and in trying to eliminate congenital syphilis. So lack of education on the cause, on syphilis itself, the causes, the prevention, signs and symptoms among users, which are the patients themselves and providers, the people looking after them. So they don't always recognize syphilis when they see it. Fortunately for pregnant women, there is a program that says, um, you know, you have to test all women. Uh, testing. In the general population, so there's ongoing transmission um, and then the issues of late booking. We have had on and off shortages of benzathin penicillin here in South Africa. Supplies are normalizing. I don't know about other countries. Um, the issues of case definitions um, that are not uniform across countries. We use a definition that's aligned to the, to, to the WHO definition but other countries don't. And then our data systems are not sometimes fit for purpose. It's difficult to link maternal and neonatal data to be able to see you know, what happened to those women that had syphilis and the babies that they gave birth to. So, and I've already alluded to the issue of limited uh, long-term follow-up of infants that are both symptomatic and asymptomatic for long-term outcomes. Um, next slide. So I think that's the last one. Yeah, so I hope I've convinced you, if you went already, that congenital syphilis remains a public health problem. The burden is increasing in high-income countries that have good systems to pick it up. We don't know what's happening in the majority of low-income countries because we don't have good data uh, or evidence of this increasing burden. Um, interventions to improve testing and treatment are needed. Uh, including identification of women that seroconvert during pregnancy. And we need to improve our systems to be able to detect cases and track them. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop here and then uh, have a discussion later on in the chat. Thank you very much for that comprehensive overview about congenital syphilis and sharing some data from South Africa. But as you've shared, um, the increase is actually global. And it's very important that we are aware and try to make sure we check and prevent it in pregnancy and ensure we do not miss treating congenital syphilis early. So thank you so much. As we mentioned earlier, the Q&A, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll have an opportunity to have them answered uh, in the Q&A or also uh, verbally later on. Our next presentation is on the prevalence associated factors and clinical features of congenital syphilis among newborns in Mbarara Hospital in Uganda. And our presenter will be Prof Associate Professor Juliet Mwanga Mumpaire, who's the director of the Epicenter Mbarara Research Center, Uganda. Dr. Professor Mumpaire is a Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Child Health and the director of the Epicenter Mbarara Research Center. She holds a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree from Mbarra University of Science and Technology, Mbarra, a Master of Medicine in Pediatrics and Child Health from Makere University, Kampala, and a PhD in Health Sciences from the College of Health Sciences, Makere. She has over 20 years experience in academia and research. Her areas of interest include infectious diseases in children and improving the quality of care for common childhood infections in resource 
limited settings. Professor Mwanga Amumpaire, you're very welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Philip Amsoke. Uh, okay, and thank you very much, Dr. Tindesai, for making my life easy. But just for emphasis, today I'm going to share results of a study that we carried out here in Barara just to see how syphilis presents in our setting. So just for emphasis, congenital syphilis is a potentially fatal and yet preventable disease and adverse outcomes are worse in newborns whose mothers have syphilis but have not been treated. Untreated, the prob probability of vertical transmission of syphilis from mother to child is 45 to 70% to globally, but we shall see what it is in Uganda. And over 90% of the cases of congenital syphilis occur in low-income countries, of which Uganda is one. So just for the context for us to understand, that is Uganda in uh, a landlocked country in East Africa. It's been a low-income country, but now we are told that we are in the lower middle income. The GDP is 9,056 US dollars. And the population is really high, growing very fast. The recent uh, statistics is 49.9 million people, majority of who are young people. The burden of diseases are mainly infectious diseases, including HIV, malaria, and respiratory infections. Great progress has been made over the years, actually, in the health sector. And just to mention uh, the neonatal mortality rate had stagnated, but uh, UNICEF, recent UNICEF data shows that it's around 18 to 20, which is still above uh, the figure of 12.5 to attain the sustainable development goals. So according to the Ministry of Health of Uganda, 86% of our population can access healthcare facilities within five kilometers. But I guess the actual question is, what is the quality of the health services that the people are getting even if it's within five kilometers. And healthcare provision in Uganda is mainly, is really pluralistic with the uh, people getting care from private health facilities, from public health facilities, and some, a big portion also actually got traditional healers. About 73% of multiparous uh, mothers attend antenatal care late if they attend at all. Uh, Mbarara, where our study was carried out, located is located within the, in Western Uganda, this red circle here. So our study was carried out in Mbarara Regional Referral Hospital, which is uh, a public referral hospital. It serves around six districts, but actually the population is much more, maybe one million and above, because it does receive patients from neighboring countries, especially the, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Tanzania. It is the teaching hospital of Mbara University of Science and Technology and has a bed capacity of around 600. It provides preventive, curative, and promotive care. And the maternity ward delivers up to 10,000 mothers per year. Uh, Mbara, the HIV uh, prevalence in Mbara region is quite high, among the highest in the country. It stands at 14.4% compared to 5.1% nationally. So this study was done in this context. It was a cross-sectional study to describe prevalence and maternal factors associated with congenital syphilis among newborns delivered at this hospital. We carried out this study in four months uh, in 2015, and uh, it, we limited it to only mothers whose babies were alive. We collected data on structured questionnaires and we did the testing of mothers following the CDC 2010 STD treatment guidelines. So this is how we did the testing. Uh, if the mother fulfilled criteria to be, to be included in the study, we screened her for uh, the history of syphilis during pregnancy, and then we tested her with, uh, using venous blood. We used uh, both the treponema and non treponema tests, in particular the treponema paldum theme oxygenation uh, test and a rapid, protein, uh, uh, yeah, rapid protein reacting test. We used uh, 
both tests in mothers who tested positive. And if the mother tested positive, then we examined uh, their newborns seriously to see if we could pick any clinical features of congenital syphilis. And then we, we took off blood from the babies whose mothers were RPR positive and tested them with the same RPR to compare uh, to, to, to compare the ratios. And if the ratio of, of the mother, of baby to mother was fourfold, the baby was taken to have congenital syphilis. So this was the flow chart of our participants. So out of the 2,692 mothers who attended the uh, hospital then, we enrolled 2,500 and we tested them with uh, the TPHA. Out of these, 117 mothers uh, tested positive, uh, uh, yeah, tested positive for TPHA, and therefore we uh, tested them with RPR. And out of these, 103 mothers tested positive. We tested the babies of all these 103 mothers with RPR, and 94 babies tested positive because their titers were fourfold higher than uh, their mothers. So the median age of the mothers uh, was young. They were 20 years, uh, in the range, uh, 15 to 36 years. Uh, we took history of treatment for genital ulcer, vaginal discharge, or lower abdominal pain, because these are known risk factors for congenital syphilis. And out of these, 74% of the mothers had had these symptoms in the pre in previous pregnancies. However, 90.7% had had these symptoms in the current pregnancy. 89.7% of our mothers were multiparous and 88.9% uh, had a single sexual partner. So among uh, all these mothers, the 2,500, only 54% had been screened for syphilis during the current pregnancy. And for those who had tested or been screened for syphilis during uh, pregnancy, around 20, 29 uh, tested positive with RPR. They, they had these positive results. However, uh, uh, however, out of these uh, mothers, only around uh, 15 got treatment for syphilis. And among them, uh, about which is around 40% of their spouses had been uh, treated for syphilis. So what were the clinical features that we found? In uh, the, the, the 103 babies, um, majority had hepato splenomegaly. However, we see that there was a range of uh, clinical features that appear in syphilis. We had a syphilis crash, as you see from those babies, and this commission in the feet. Uh, we had uh, very just one patient, but just one child had a condylar matter. Uh, we had rhinitis in only two patients. Uh, there was three with jaundice. Uh, we did not have any child with uh, anemia. And we see that the prevalence of syphilis, therefore, in the uh, the mothers was four point one percent. This is in keeping with the, the national figures, which is which is around five point five. However, congenital syphilis was quite high. The, the literature we had then was saying 2.5, but it was, ours was 3.8, which was quite high nationally. So the maternal factors associated with syphilis among all, the significant ones were the age of the mother, young age group, less than 24, uh, previous history of genital ulcer, was also significantly associated with congenital syphilis, previous history of ab abnormal vaginal discharge, and then history of not having been treated for a gentle ulcer, uh, itching, abdominal pain, and vaginal discharge when they had uh, such a symptom in the current pregnancy. Yeah, for the discussion, therefore, we, we say, we found that there was higher than expected syphilis, a prevalence of syphilis, congenital syphilis in the Barra Regional Reparo Hospital, and the high rates of uh, uh, syphilis seroprevalence among the mothers, which were comparable to the country then, even if recently there was a paper published from another hospital from uh, Port Porter in the West, which shows a prevalence of 27%, which is quite high. A young maternal age um, uh, was among the key risk factors, and this is comparable 
uh, to the literature that uh, even Dr. Sindasai uh, told to us. We noted that uh, there are still gaps which exist in preventing uh, congenital syphilis, despite the country having policies. And this is mainly because of um, lack of stock of the testing kits, but also we think because of uh, health workers not having adequate knowledge, because as I said, that uh, healthcare is provided by different cadre of staff. Uh, personal and health system barriers also exist because uh, people have to travel long distances sometimes to access care, or even when they reach there, they do not find the resources, uh, the testing kits, their challenges in storage of other test kits. Therefore, there is need to, in to increase advocacy and increased funding and implementation of existing guidelines at national level to be able to fight congenital systems. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. That's what I had to share with you this afternoon. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Juliet Mwanga, Amampaire. Uh, we appreciate your covering and that important study recognizing the, the challenge of congenital syphilis, even in our local Ugandan context, and the importance of identifying these children and also preventing syphilis in these children. So thank you very much for that important study. And we'll have Q&A. Please ask your questions in the Q&A so we can discuss them uh, after the last presentation. Excellent uh, presentation, an excellent study. Uh, our last presentation will be on uh, surveillance for rubella and congenital rubella syndrome, a perspective from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. And the person presenting is Dr. Kerrigan MacArthur. She's a specialist pathologist, Center for Vaccines and Immunology, National Institute for Communicable Diseases, South Africa. Dr. Kerrigan MacArthur is a pathologist at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. She has worked in laboratory diagnostics and public health related to communicable disease since the early 2000s, initially in TB and HIV, opportunistic fungal infections, outbreak response, and surveillance for vaccine preventable diseases, including measles, rubella, hepatitis, and polio. She manages congenital rubella surveillance in South Africa. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, today, I hope to give a perspective from so South Africa um, and uh, recognizing that the audience um, is a global audience, um, but hoping that there will be opportunity to uh, learn from um, uh, what we're doing and what we're not doing and uh, um, take away some um, insights from our surveillance program. Um, I hope to talk about uh, notifiable medical condition surveillance in South Africa in general, so as to contextualize what we uh, are doing and then uh, and how we found and how we um, keep track of our cases and data, and then um, to look at the status of the notifiable medical condition surveillance program for acute rubella and congenital rubella in South Africa. I'll then go through some of the data that um, we have gleaned from our system, and then talk to the introduction of measles and rubella vaccine that's scheduled for uh, this year and the next year, 2024 and 2025. So, um, uh, informal medical uh, uh, surveillance for notifiable medical conditions um, was conducted um, prior to 2016 in South Africa by the National Department of Health. But in 2015, a memorandum of agreement uh, or understanding was developed between ourselves, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, and the National Department of Health. So we are, uh, as the NICD, the um, public National Public Health Reference Laboratory for uh, the country, um, and we do provide epidemiological and surveillance support for the provinces in our country. So we started off initially with a paper-based system uh, where uh, clinicians were uh, requested to notify 
uh, cases according to a pre-specified list. And slowly uh, we uh, put this, these paper-based forms um, onto an app and launched this app in around um, 2018. Um, since then, we've been uh, encouraging um, uh, electronic notification rather than paper-based, but we still um, include both systems. And then um, the standard notification form is a general form. We've also been adding uh, specific uh, case investigation forms for each condition onto the notifiable medical conditions surveillance form. Um, we've also added uh, a hospitalization form and then uh, added some back-end support that will allow us uh, to uh, perform real-time data cleaning. So uh, this is a screenshot showing, um, uh, uh, and it's quite blurred so you won't be able to see the detail, the basic form that we uh, request um, clinicians, healthcare providers to use when notifying the cases. Um, and if you go to our website, and I've got the link in the next slide, um, you can see the various modalities that allow um, electronic download and then also allow access to uh, stakeholders and people who use the data um, at different levels of the healthcare system to access the back end network database um, and to uh, obtain um, data downloads. So in order to notify um, on the system, one has to be registered. And when you register, you choose the level of the health system that you operate at. And then um, you're allowed um, access to the system uh, at, at predefined levels, either just notification or notification and data receipt. So um, the South African uh, list of notifiable medical condition surveillance is published in our government gazette, uh, and it's updated from time to time. So the first list was issued in 1971, uh, and it was most recently updated in February 2023. Um, we have four categories of notifiable medical conditions. Uh, category one are those conditions that should be notified within 24 hours of diagnosis by healthcare providers. And I've shown that list there um, to the right of uh, 25 conditions. And highlighted in yellow, uh, you can see uh, is congenital rubella syndrome and uh, rubella, which is actually acute rubella infection. The reason for uh, this request to notify on clinical suspicion is that uh, for all of these conditions, there is an immediate public health action that can take place to curb the transmission of the uh, infectious agent. And uh, the, um, the uh, infectious agent itself um, has consequences when uh, transmission occurs. And so it's highly desirable to have early notification and early public health intervention. There is also, um, it is also possible for the majority of these conditions um, to make um, a reasonably good clinical diagnosis. Um, and to um, it's also possible to act on this clinical diagnosis um, in such a way as uh, to intervene meaningfully. Um, just for interest, uh, category two conditions are those that need to be diagnosed with or at least reported within um, seven days of diagnosis. Um, and these should be notified on receipt of laboratory confirmation. And then category three and four um, are things that should be notified um, and are merely um, for the purposes of um, trend reporting. So in this case, um, category four, we look at antimicrobial resistance um, and um, other longer term uh, conditions that have longer term consequences. So um, this rather complicated diagram um, essentially shows um, the uh, 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 back-end uh, data flows. It's a data architecture map, and um, it talks to the uh, the sources of data that are uh, inputted into the system. So um, the clinician notifiable uh, conditions um, are uh, submitted uh, to the NMC system um, that's in the bottom um, half, 
and um, paper notification systems are entered and submitted either by email and um, entered into this data mart. At the same time, um, data from the NHLS laboratories and private laboratories and medical schemes is also uploaded into the NMC data mart. And there is a sorting process that happens um, at the back end that allows um, uh, conditions that are that meet certain criteria um, to be notified both to uh, back to clinicians um, and to various levels of the health system um, in province and national government. Um, essentially, the two data sources are both uh, are laboratory data sources and clinical data sources, and this leads to uh, some problems in terms of the data management. Um, you can appreciate that if uh, a person suspects measles and you diagnose and report a measles case on the basis of um, a clinical notification, that there may be a subsequent laboratory test for that same patient. And that's, this will lead to duplicate notifications for the same patient and means that uh, these cases must be merged or cleaned to make a single case rather than two separate cases. We also will have the instances where we land up with spurious notifications where we have uh, the wrong diagnosis made, um, or and which is uh, not impossible for a Category 1 because we're requested to notify on the basis of clinical suspicion. Um, and then, therefore, we need a way to uh, de-notify these cases when the laboratory test turns out to be negative, say, for measles. And then we also have a system, uh, a, a consequence where um, we have a false positive laboratory test, and this leads to an incorrect notification. And I'm going to talk to this in um, some of our uh, rubella data um, for um, congenital rubella syndrome. So a system for merging and cleaning data by specialist centers um, is in operation and is gradually being strengthened. So moving on to acute rubella and congenital rubella um, syndrome. Why should we do surveillance at all? Well, congenital rubella syndrome is a devastating infection uh, and it is easily present, prevented by vaccination with uh, rubella vaccine. And because we have such a good vaccine that elicits um, the highest uh, um, seroconversion and uh, neutralizing antibody levels of all uh, vaccines, um, it is quite possible to uh, prevent rubella uh, and congenital rubella syndrome through vaccination rather than leaving uh, it up to nature and to uh, natural infection to immunize the population um, and prevent congenital rubella syndrome from happening. Um, perhaps some of the most poignant reflections on rubella and congenital rubella syndrome came from someone called Stanley Plotkin, um, who was a pediatrician during the 1963 and 64 uh, rubella epidemic in the United States. And um, he writes, those of us who were practicing pediatricians or um, obstetricians during those years remember with poignancy the many tragedies we witnessed as families struggled with decisions about therapeutic abortions and severely damaged infants. Um, some of the uh, clinical presentations of congenital rubella syndrome can be seen in the table on the right. Um, the most notable and devastating of all is um, neonatal death um, or pregnancy loss um, early in the first trimester. But congenital rubella syndrome um, amongst children who survive leads to lifelong deafness or blindness or both, um, men mental impairment and um, congenital uh, cardiac abnormalities um, that may uh, impair survival and or incur enormous hospital expense. So um, this is not an infection to be um, ignored. And um, if it is possible, which it is to prevent, we should firstly uh, do surveillance and secondly um, implement measles rubella vaccine. So how do we do surveillance for uh, a, um, congenital rubella and acute rubella? Um, we have a system of case definitions that um, may be found on our website. Um, and for acute rubella, we use the measles case definition and conduct um, rubella 
acute rubella surveillance uh, as part of fever rash surveillance, um, which is the um, universal and global method of uh, measles surveillance. So our case definition is um, one of fever, rash, and one of uh, cough conjunctivitis or coryza. And this is the same case definition as measles. Um, the two are clinically indistinguishable. However, rubella, acute rubella infection may present in a milder um, fashion than uh, measles. Um, we confirm the case by doing serology and um, a rubella IgM positive sample within 28 days after the onset of rash um, is diagnostic for acute rubella. The case definition of congenital rubella syndrome is a little bit more complicated because it requires not only um, laboratory diagnostics but also um, appropriate um, clinical um, uh, uh, features um, because it is a syndrome. Um, and the uh, WHO allows uh, two kind of clinical case definitions, um, a suspected clinical case definition and a clinically confirmed case definition. And um, our case definitions adhere to these WHO uh, conditions. If uh, a laboratory testing is possible, um, the presence of rubella IgM in um, a neonate or a child under the age of one years of age um, or a rubella PCR test um, on any sample um, uh, makes uh, in combination with uh, clinical signs and symptoms um, is diagnostic for rubella. So the clinical uh, criteria are that a person should have, a child should have either two of the symptoms or signs listed in uh, category A or one in category A and one in category B. So category A are the, is the classic triad of um, ophthalmological uh, defects or cataracts, congenital, uh, including congenital glaucoma, um, and secondly, um, congenital heart disease, and then um, thirdly, uh, sensory neural deafness or loss of hearing. Um, pigmentary retinopathy is one of the um, op, uh, ophthalmological criteria. Um, then if a child only has one or other uh, one or other of these conditions in A, um, they should have a second condition in B, and that can be any of purpura, splenomegaly, microcephaly, mental retardation, meningitis, encephalitis, radiolucent bone disease, jaundice that begins 24 hours after birth. So um, you'll appreciate that um, the diagnosis of um, congenital rubella syndrome requires both clinical assessment of the patient and um, a uh, laboratory diagnostic test. Um, laboratory, if a child um, uh, meets the clinical case definition, they may be regarded by the WHO as the case of congenital rubella um, without uh, confirmatory laboratory testing. Um, however, the converse is not true, that if we have uh, a IgM positive uh, infant, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, and, uh, that they have... Um, uh, congenital rubella syndrome without an assessment of their clinical status. So um, one of the challenges that we have in our system, and I'll speak to it later, is that because we get all laboratory data, we often have the laboratory uh, IgM positive result, but we don't have the clinical uh, notes that accompany or case investigation form that accompanies our data. And so um, while we can be sure that the is uh, an, a positive uh, rubella IgM test, we're not sure whether or not uh, the child met the, or had the clinical criteria that allow the case definition to be met. So moving on to some of the data that um, we obtain from um, our surveillance system. Um, these two graphs um, on the left and then on the right show um, the prevalence of rubella IgM in children and adults over the age of one year. Um, the different lines rep and colors represent the different years, and the horizontal axis represents the epidemiological weeks of the year, and the uh, vertical axis represents the number of cases identified by week. And what you'll notice immediately is that the um, Num the high number of cases tends to occur in the second half of the year, and this is in South Africa our spring season, and so we've noticed, and I think it's uh, globally uh, um, a feature of acute rubella that the um, 
uh, rubella outbreaks occur in spring. Um, however, the uh, pattern changed in 2020, and um, uh, hence we have a different graph over here because you'll see the vertical axis goes up to 18 in the graph on the right, but only 200. Uh, 200 in the graph on the left. Um, from 2020, we experienced a marked reduction in the number of acute rubella cases, and this was because of the implementation of SARS-CoV-2 non-pharmaceutical interventions in March 2020. So the green line represents the number of cases by week in 2020, and you'll see um, from uh, week 18, um, it absolutely went to zero, and we had very few cases thereafter. You'll see in 2023 that we started seeing cases again, but 2021 and 2022, we had almost no rubella cases in South Africa. He has an updated graph for last year, and again, uh, it seems as if we have returned to the um, predilection uh, for the second half of the year in, in spring, and we are presently seeing a similar pattern in 2024. So, from the uh, fever rash surveillance data where we look for IgM for rubella, we also able to look at IgG for rubella. And this tells us uh, how many people have been exposed to rubella. And one of the useful things about rubella infection is that it is a um, immunizing infection. And by this, we mean once you've been infected with rubella virus, like Zika virus, you can never get rubella again. And so, um, uh, in, in, infection, acute infection with the virus effectively prevents um, congenital rubella syndrome, which may be acquired when um, mothers uh, are um, susceptible to rubella and infected with rubella virus during the first trimester of pregnancy. So um, this graph shows the, um, the uh, proportion of IgG negative persons by age group um, and this data is a compilation of data from um, 2013 to 2023. And you'll see um, that by the age 15 to 19 and 20, 20, 20 to 24 years of age, um, uh, more than 90% of people have anti IgG antibodies to rubella or 10% uh, of persons have uh, absent IgG to rubella. And this means that um, effectively, only 10% of the uh, female population um, in these age groups, and the, these are the women of reproductive age, are susceptible to acute rubella and may therefore uh, land up having um, uh, congenital or causing or being a part of the causal pathway of congenital uh, rubella syndrome. Um, this shows uh, the number of um, acute rubella um, sorry, not the number of rubella cases, the number of IgG positive rubella cases by cohort um, in terms of the, the total number. And then the red line shows the percentage positive um, by year. And um, you can see um, that the vast majority of samples submitted to us for fever rash surveillance um, test positive for acute rubella. Um, so we, as I um, alluded to in previous slides, one of the problems that we've uh, experienced now as we prepare to introduce um, the measles rubella vaccine is that we have a larger than usual immunological gap in our population um, because we've had uh, three years, 2020, 2021 and 22, where we did not have a uh, uh, the usual spring seasonal outbreak of uh, acute rubella. And that meant that um, people in this age group um, have not effectively been immunized against rubella. Um, and this means that uh, unless they get acute rubella or are vaccinated in the years to come, they may land up not uh, being protected if they are female from uh, the possibility of uh, rubella infection during pregnancy. Um, this series of graphs over here, and perhaps I should explain it first, shows um, the proportion of the age group uh, that is uh, seropositive or has IgM um, by year. Um, so this was in 2018, and you can see that the one to four year age category, 30% were positive, the five to nine age category, 70% were positive, etc. And um, what you can see as the years go by, um, including 2020 and 2021, that um, there was a decline in the number of people who were protected 
from rubella and this has created an immunological gap why is that important because we hope to implement the measles rubella vaccine and um, the way we do it has um, bearing or at least the immunological gap has bearing on the way we implement the uh, measles rubella vaccine so moving on to congenital rubella surveillance data this uh, these tables over here in this graph show the number of um, congenital rubella notifications that we've, re we've received through the NMC system. Now, um, the case type graph uh, here in the middle uh, table shows the source of the notification. And you'll see that by far the majority of notification cases that we've received are laboratory based um, with a handful of cases notified by the clinician. And the problem is, as I've alluded to that, um, when we receive an IgM, positive in a child under the age of one, we don't have the clinical data and we don't know whether this child uh, meets the WHO syndrome uh, requirements with uh, the classic triad of uh, um, sensory neural deafness, ophthalmological disorders and congenital heart disease. Um, so it, at best, uh, these numbers are an estimation of the uh, potential cases of congenital rubella syndrome, but we can't be sure unless we get the case notes. And um, essentially, uh, this is a breakdown of the number of cases aged less than one and then one to two, and sometimes um, we don't receive an age date. Uh, date. And this is the provincial breakdown showing um, the provincial dominance um, with the number of cases um, in the Western Cape peaking um, in the last few years in keeping with the uh, localized outbreaks of uh, acute rubella infection that we've experienced in those cases. And then in the red, um, one of the provinces, KwaZulu-Natal. So the challenges that we have in case notification are that there may be indiscriminate testing um, for rubella IgM at birth. And we've picked this up in a number of cases where we have managed to find case notes. What we find on the case notes is that when an infant is born with neonatal sepsis, the doctor in South Africa does what is called a torch screen. And the torch screen is um, a set of um, serology tests for congenital infections, um, including toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, um, and uh, congenital uh, CM, you know, CMV, I said, and um, herpes virus infections. These infections are all unrelated and have uh, more or less different clinical presentations, but the doctors indiscriminately test for these. And what happens often is that a rubella test may be IgM positive, but the clinician is not aware of it because they've either made another diagnosis or the child had a bacterial sepsis and has been treated and has been discharged. And when we come back, to the notes, we cannot say yes or no whether or not congenital anomalies were present because you'll appreciate that some uh, congenital heart disease cases are not evident um, at birth um, and sensory neural deafness is often not looked for or there's no note that there was a hearing test done. And so it's absolutely impossible to decide whether or not this child meets the case definition. And um, we also find, and uh, this is where tender size uh, work is interesting, that we have um, false positive infections due to uh, simultaneous infection with congenital syphilis or with um, the syphilis organism. So this is a case uh, where we obtained the case notes. Um, the child um, had herpes simplex virus positive serology, rubella, uh, IgM positive serology, um, and these serology assays were probably both false positive because of the presence of trypanema pallidum, um, IgM, um, and um, NT. Uh, um, lipoprotein or um, uh, phospholipid antibodies um, that cross-reacted with the ELISA. So this is some of the challenges that we've been facing um, as we try to strengthen um, congenital rubella surveillance. So um, we want to uh, eliminate measles rubella um, because we uh, are able to, and because this is part of the global uh, measles rubella um, targets set by the WHO um, and part of the strategic framework to eliminate measles rubella. Um, it's highly possible to eliminate uh, both infections because there's no animal reservoir and these viruses have um, a single unchanging uh, uh, serotype and they're not subject to um, viral mutations with the same degree of frequency as SARS-CoV-2, for example, and they are very effective and safe vaccines for both. So um, South Africa is one of 22 remaining countries and you can see the um, 
countries in green that do have not implemented rubella vaccine. Um, we are in this situation because we had a number of competing health priorities in years gone by. Um, HIV and tuberculosis were some of them. And we also uh, were very reluctant to um, incur Uh, there was um, improper um, and uh, disparate and patchy implementation of rubella vaccine that led to a paradoxical increase of congenital rubella syndrome between uh, five to 10 years after implementation of the vaccine. We decided to implement um, measles rubella vaccine as opposed to MMR um, purely because um, of the difference in cost. So the MMR as 84 Rand or 50 Rand, whereas um, the actual MR vaccine is um, uh, almost the same price as the measles vaccine alone. Um, we have decided as a country after much deliberation to do a direct swap. We used to give measles vaccine alone at six and 12 months. So we're going to swap this and give measles rubella vaccine at six and 12 months. As far as I know, we are the only country in the world that will be giving this vaccine at this early stage. Um, there was a decision made in 2016 to um, uh, give measles vaccine at six and 12 months as opposed to nine and 12 or 18 months. And the reason for this was a devastating measles outbreak in 2009 to 11, where 25% of our children um, uh, who developed measles were under nine months of age, which was the age at vaccination, and mortality in this group of children is very high. It was thought that part of the reason for this was our high um, HIV seroprevalence in pregnant women that led to a decline in transfer of measles IgM to children and also reduced longevity of maternal uh, antibodies in children that led to children being more susceptible at an earlier age. Um, we have established that the vaccine, the rubella vaccine, is safe um, when given at six and 12 months. Um, and so um, the rollout is planned for uh, 2025 and 2026. Along with uh, the uh, direct swap, there will be a wide age ranging campaign. Um, and the reason for this is that um, as we've seen, there will be children um, at the start of the vaccination campaign who have never had wild type rubella infection. And if uh, on, they are not vaccinated, they will remain susceptible. And one of the factors about rubella is that because it has a low reproductive uh, number and a low herd immunity threshold, um, with the early, soon after the introduction of rubella vaccination, the number of susceptible people in the population is such so low that um, rubella uh, does not um, occur. So natural circulation of rubella stops. And this means that those people who are susceptible at the time of implementation of the vaccine will remain susceptible into adulthood. And so to prevent these children from getting um, congenital rubella syndrome or being part of a chain of transmission that leads to infection of pregnant women, um, a wide age ranging campaign is necessary. So a number of um, countries that have implemented measles rubella vaccine in the last few years have conducted this wide age ranging campaign targeting children aged nine months to 15 years. And this has, um, and the very high coverage associated with these campaigns um, has uh, led to sustained reduction of rubella um, across a wide range of continents. So um, just to acknowledge, well, thanks um, my colleagues who have helped prepare and provide the data and slides for this presentation um, and happy to take questions. Over. Thank you very much. That was a really detailed and comprehensive overview of rubella. And it's amazing uh, what I think South Africa has moved to. I know it's always hard to try and balance which uh, which infection should you take care of first? But I think it's really important that you prioritize. And I think now's the time. So thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, we now move into question and answers. Please put up your hand if you have a question. Uh, this is the Q&A time. It's free for anybody who puts up their hand, then you'll be asked to, to ask your question. But meanwhile, I thought we'd go back and take some of the questions have already been answered in the chat, but I think they were quite important questions, maybe for the larger uh, group to hear the answer. So I'll start with Professor um, Hashini uh, about the, um, the environmental effects of Zika virus. That was one I thought you should address. 
And then the you answered the one about Zika in Uganda, but I think it'd be interesting to hear the larger population to hear what you say, because I think it's been a question all along since the epidemic. Then okay. I'll the other Yeah, so I'll start with Zika in Uganda, and then I move to the other one. Uh, this was a, a heat debate. Why uh, in Uganda, uh, microcephaly was not noticed back in 50s, 60s, and so on. So there are two uh, explanations that are not ex uh, excluded. The first one is that the virus that arrived in Brazil and in South America is uh, a, a called an Asian lineage is a different strain. There are some genetic mutations that it was shown that have more ability to enter in the developing uh, brain. But even the African lineage could have produced microcephaly. However, the, 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 the way the infection occurred in Uganda was different in Brazil, because in Brazil it spread out, it was many, many children being born from infected mothers. So the opportunity to detect the microcephaly because of the numbers at the same time of people affected uh, have uh, facilitated the, uh, the identification because microcephaly was observed retrospective in some Asian islands, French uh, Asian um, French islands, French territories, sorry, and uh, it was only after Brazil launched the alarm, so they noticed some cases there. And the other thing, it's important. I think it's related to surveillance and vigilance uh, of uh, congenital anomalies. Perhaps some cases were born, but not reported and died immediately after. Um, imagine that was in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, probably uh, even in Brazil. Brazil uh, was not concerned about congenital anomalies because we are a middle country, low income country. So I think that... Uh, Zika is one example of uh, how important it is to look to congenital anomalies that sometimes we can have outbreaks of, uh, of uh, or epidemics of congenital anomalies. Uh, the other question uh, was about the climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, the question of the climate change, I mean, uh, climate, uh, global warming. So many, it's not just Zika, dengue and other, um, how can I say, called tropical <laughs> infections now are spreading to temperate uh, latitudes, which means that uh, I live in South Brazil, which is more temperate. And now we have dengue, we, ha we have Zika. So the climate change is uh, making that these original very uh, restricted, restricted infections to some geographic areas are spreading uh, all over the world, plus travel and everything. But climate change is a, a major drive to the vector uh, expansion in other uh, latitudes. Mm. Yes. Thank you so much for those responses. I'll also move on to some other questions which were in the chat. Uh, this is for Dr. Kufa Kachesa. Uh, you already answered it, but I think it'd be good for everyone to listen to about congenital syphilis uh, and the gap and the issue about long-term growth or neurodevelopment effects of infants with congenital syphilis in Africa. If you could just take us through your response about uh, the data for the long-term data on congenital syphilis in Africa. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that important question. Um, my response had been, uh, when I was looking up data for this, I didn't meet any studies from Africa describing long-term effects. So that's really an important research gap. Even here in South Africa, we have a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. we have data relatively to other, relative to other countries in Africa. We, we also don't have data on the long-term consequences of 
um, syphilis exposure or when you're having con symptomatic congenital uh, syphilis at birth. The only study I found that's recent uh, was from Brazil, and Brazil was able to do this. Uh, and I can see Lavinia nodding because they are very good data systems. They have a national electronic medical record. So all you know, clinical data is in one place. And then they have a very good notification system for moms and babies. So they're able to link these three data sets together and find infants who had congenital syphilis and notified as cases of congenital syphilis, confirm that they did have congenital syphilis and look at outcomes later on in years and they found higher mortality and morbidity in these children uh just cognitive you know um delayed milestones and and cognitive deficits um based on that so it's i think the brazilian system is a good model for other countries because trying to build cohorts and following them up we are looking at a lot of infants and following them over a long time. But if you have an electronic system that does it for you on its own, and all you have to do is match the data. But you know, us in Africa, there's an opportunity there is we are building electronic medical systems for HIV, for TB, and for all these things to also integrate and be thinking about how to um how to piggyback on those systems and improve surveillance for these infections that, you know, in the grand scheme of things are quite rare. You know, if you compare like congenital syphilis to pneumonia in infants, yeah. for example, I mean, that's yeah. OTB in infants. That's, it's not on the same scale, but that doesn't make them less important. It's just to say, you can't, it's difficult to go to a funder and say, I want to build a cohort for infants with congenital syphilis and follow them up for 10 years to see what happens to them. That's going to take time and money. But if you leverage data systems that are already existing and collecting these data, um, data elements, then we might be more successful at a cost that are, that's affordable for our programs. Um, some countries have HIV as a notifiable medical condition and have systems to follow up HIV exposed babies mm -hmm. uh, outside of research settings. I, I don't know if any, but just thinking that that's also another avenue to um, integrate with other congenital infections or childhood illnesses for which we require to follow up uh, children for outcomes. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, actually. We've often said the HIV systems have been put in place and we should try to leverage them for other infections. So that's a really mm -hmm. important uh, point. Obviously, Brazil has their system, which is uh, very well uh, developed, but it's a high and middle income country. So it's a bit harder mm -hmm. to, to try and copy. Uh, I just want to move on to also have Professor Juliet Wanga Mumpaire. You answered your question about congenital syphilis and the use of TPHA and RPR. Maybe you can just summarize the tests that are used. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if the noise is too much, but the tests that are used to identify those babies that are actually infected. You responded in the chat, but just clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Philippa. Yes, so the question was, uh, would a baby who tests positive for TPH receive treatment. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, okay, yeah. So according to the guidelines, uh, so for mothers, we should have both uh, troponema and non troponema tests. So that troponema, that is TPHA and the others, these could be positive even if the mother had a previous infection, uh, but stays serologically positive. And these antibodies could be passed on to the baby through the placenta. For you to confirm that it's an active infection, then you have to do the RPR or the VDRL. So the baby should test positive for those. And actually it has to be a quantitative test where you compare the maternal titers and the baby's titers. So if the baby's titers are fourfold higher than the mother's, then the baby has an active infection. If the titers are equal or less than the mother's, maybe it is not uh, the baby does not have infection especially if the mother received appropriate treatment during pregnancy however if the mother did not receive treatment 
and the baby has clinical features that are in keeping with uh, syphilis in our low resource setup where you can may not be able to do all that is then it's important to treat this baby you rather treat than this in the future yeah okay thank you very much um i don't know if people are still online ronald um semakula are you still online you had two questions one was for um dr kufa kachesa about uh congenital syphilis in high income countries if you'd like to ask your question and the second one was for professor mccarthy if you're still online, if you could uh, answer ask those questions, please. Uh, yes, Professor Philippa, I'm still online. Um, hello to everyone. Thanks for the amazing presentations. Uh, so my question was to uh, Professor Dr. Chakeza uh, for the increasing incidence of uh, congenital syphilis in high income countries. As you know, many of these diseases tend to have a particular predilection to certain demographic groups. So in those studies that you researched, all those papers that you reviewed, was that information included? Was it affecting more immigrants, for instance, that we, and we see a huge kind of a case surge of immigration within, a, within the USA and Canada, um, and, or did we also see it more prevalent amongst uh, the, you know, the minority groups? Yeah, yeah thank you. Then to Professor uh, MacArthur, uh, about about the rubella, uh, in cases where the diagnosis is made uh, uh, for the mother who's pregnant, and um, is there is, could that be justification, say, for the mom to ask for, to terminate the pregnancy? Do you have a huge ethical debate about that in South Africa, um, or are there measures whereby the pregnancy can just be uh, monitored over time? And maybe I can just squeeze in one more. Uh, in the notifications uh, for that amazing app that you designed, uh, I, I was a bit surprised to not see uh, Pavo virus B19 included because we know it can cause a uh, hydrops vitalis. Um, and we know that that is also spread uh, kind of like, it, it's it's a very highly infectious disease, though there are no actual, I don't, I'm not very sure if I've vaccines about it. Please correct me on that matter. Uh, why is that the case? Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Roland. We'll hear from uh, the, I just want one last person to ask their question because Dr. Uh, Ignacio Ragarayre Mundoma had a question. I'm not sure for who. Um, if you're still on, please, can you ask your question? Um, and then we'll have the answers. Over. Ignacio, are you, can you unmute? Or can you be unmuted? Um, are we going to unmute Ignacio? Hi, Jennifer. Um, so, in theory, Ignacio should be able to unmute themselves now. Oh, they can. Okay, please yeah. unmute yourself. Ignacio, I saw he came up. Okay, maybe he's busy. He had said, uh, hello, Dr. Mary. I'm um, May. I'm not sure, Dr. May. Enlighten us about primary causes of microcephaly and what advances are being made in its early detection and prevention. Uh, maybe that's for Professor Fassini. But can we um, address, uh, you know who questions were asked? Please go ahead. We'll ask Dr. Kufa Kachesa to start and then Dr. Uh, McCarthy and then Professor Fassini. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, so it's an also an important question. So in the high income countries, um, the communities that are, battling the most with uh, rising congenital syphilis cases will be like your ethnic minorities, like in the in the US, your um, the Indian, American Indian communities that have traditionally been isolated. And so now you're starting to see more and more people um, with limited health care and limited opportunities also moving and, and just being more mobile than before. Um, it's socioeconomic status, uh, so poorer neighborhoods. Uh, migrants haven't come up that much. It's more socioeconomic. Brazil has the best data on 
uh, maternal syphilis, I think because of the notification system, and they've done ecological analysis, looking at it at a, at a national level, what are those factors that seem to be driving? And so just poorer neighborhoods where women are not empowered, they're not educated, they've limited access to antenatal care seems to be um, the kinds of factors that are driving. So sometimes migrants do fit that bill, but I don't think it's because they are migrants. It's because they maybe live in those communities where there is generally, you know, poor access to health care, uh, unemployment, low maternal education. Um, substance abuse is a big one, especially in the U.S., um, where there is increasing drug use. Um, but I think the U.S. epidemic is unique in the sense that uh, there has been, over the years, underfunding of their public health infrastructure and their STI programs because maternal syphilis spills over from just local transmission of syphilis in communities. So if there's no uh, recognition of clinical signs and symptoms and treatment in men and women who are not pregnant, uh, eventually, uh, and there's no partner notification and contact partner tracing and 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 notification and treatment. It eventually spills over into into pregnant women. Um, Japan had a nice paper showing that they've had increases in syphilis in the general population and in pregnant women, particularly younger pregnant women, but they have not seen an increase in their congenital syphilis cases because their public health infrastructure is still very good. They meet a case. All syphilis cases in, in adults, not just in pregnant women, are notifiable, and they do contact tracing. The basics of, of managing STIs, not just uh, syphilis in particular. Um, and so if those things are not in place um, like they are, in many of our low resource countries, we expect to see that we are going to get an increase in cases. And if we're not testing and treating our pregnant women, that that's gonna happen. Um, I think I'll stop there. I don't know if I've answered the question. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Dr. McCarthy. There was a question for you about that. Question, um, a quick response um, with a more detailed answer in the chat. Uh, many moms um, who have acute rubella infection are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and don't seek health care. So the diagnosis is not made antenatally. But when it is made, then there's referral to uh, an obstetrician and um, appropriate antenatal management with scans. If congenital anomalies are identified, um, then there will be an assessment of risk. And um, uh, I'm sure that uh, termination would be offered. Um, our legislation in South Africa regarding termination of pregnancy um, would allow for a medical abortion post uh, week 20. So um, they, uh, this may be offered. And then, of course, the infant um, would have a diagnosis confirmed post-delivery, postnatally, um, with usually a rubella PCR test that would be first uh, prize. Um, interestingly enough, um, the cataract tissue that is um, taken uh, when a child has uh, with congenital cataracts undergoes surgery um, can remain IgM positive or PCR positive for uh, a number of months to years after uh, birth. So um, even late diagnoses are possible. Um, you asked about parvovirus B19. Um, this is not part of the torch screen, um, but we are able to do serological and um, uh, um, molecular diagnostics for parvovirus P90. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we move on to Professor Hassini, uh, I was just wondering, uh, Dr. McCarthy, when I saw your slides with the graphs of this significant reduction in rubella in 2020, 2021, and we're relating it to COVID vaccine, is there any possibility it was related to the lockdown? Absolutely, yes. Um, rubella is not a very infectious virus. It is transmitted through um, droplet transmission. Um, and so uh, mask wearing and social distancing and closing of the schools um, led to elimination of rubella. We're only just starting to see cases again. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Professor Fassini, um, the last question over okay. to you. I'll try to be brief. Um, 
actually microcephaly has a, a, a big range of causes. Microcephaly just says that the head circumference is lower than expected. And the majority of the times, it means that something in the brain is not well. So we have uh, both genetic, but uh, our topic here is uh, congenital infections. And Zika is just one example of congenital infection that leads to microcephaly. Rubella is another one, toxoplasmosis. In Brazil, we have much uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus as well. So uh, uh, if detected during pregnancy, there are not much we can do to revert this. So uh, I think the focus is on preconceptional um, vaccination when possible, or in the situations that we don't have nor vaccination nor treatment. For example, toxoplasmosis, we, we don't have vaccine, but we have treatment during pregnancy to treat the infection, okay? So, but to know if the woman is immune or not before getting pregnant is very important. Other um, general uh, like folic acid or other things are important too, but I, 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 I believe that knowing if, uh, if the mother is susceptible or not before getting pregnant, it's very important. For example, is the chance to get uh, vaccination for rubella if she's uh, not immune? And um, well, then there is secondary and tertiary prevention, like uh, um, a therapeutic abortion, if it's uh, not possible to, to treat, and then um, uh, later on, uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, and others to support. And it's true that for all those, those women that had children with a Zika infection here, they are now complaining that the government put a lot of effort in the first years, but now they are almost abandoned, you know, uh, to their own, uh, it, it, it's a severe condition and they have not support to all these treatments that are needed for this chronic and severe disabilitating co condition. It's a, it's a very sad, very sad. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, all our presenters and panelists for answering our questions. Um, if there are any uh, other questions, I think uh, I want to ask the panelists if there's some that maybe you would like to address that were not addressed in the chat. I know Chisanga Kabuela, um had asked something about the assessment of cases rising in congenital syphilis in Africa and what has been put in place to do the research, to monitor, We've partly answered it, but if somebody wants to address that. And then uh, Professor Mwanga Amonpaire, I was thinking, any data on access to benzathine penicillin? I guess anybody can answer that because everybody's saying, you know, that's the treatment, that's the treatment, it's cheap, but I know there are challenges. So we can wind up with those two and I'd like to hear from both of you. Start with um, Professor. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I was going to say, I was going to say, I don't know of any initiatives for congenital syphilis that have been um, that are been put out there. But I just want to encourage uh, researchers, clinicians to start with what they have, because also with us, with this congenital syphilis surveillance program that we have. Uh, that's starting to generate data and insights. Uh, we started off with just a standard notification form that uh, Kerrigan displayed earlier that didn't collect any maternal information, that didn't collect any infant information, and we saw that it was inadequate. And we approached WHO and said, we have this issue, we collect information, but we cannot confirm if these are cases and we can't classify the cases as probable or, you know, to what extent these are, or why they're notified as cases. And we can't, uh, 
um, see what interventions these moms get so that we can feed back to the program to help improve. Um, and they agreed to give us a small funding to help us get a surveillance officer to actually just drive the program and phone facilities, training on the notification system, and just raising awareness of congenital syphilis itself, the case definition, and what uh, systems were in place. Um, and COVID helped us a lot because it moved training online and I still think that it can happen. Like now we are all online, but before, you know, none of us ever thought we could do this much interaction and training online before COVID. And so you actually don't need a lot of money, uh, but just start with what you have. If it's a hospital collecting information systematically, use students, we use that a lot. We, if there are students that need projects uh, to get data, and then we support that and, and, and we, we, we work with them a lot to be able to get the information and the insights that we have from the routine data that we collect. I don't know if that helps, um, but maybe the, the, the scan, the S-SCAN network has other um, I knows of other funding initiatives that could be used to strengthen surveillance systems in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, because that's what's needed to start yeah. with. That's, thank you. Excellent. Uh, and uh, Professor Juliet Mwanga, we just want to hear about uh, benzathine phenylacetylene. Our time is nearly up, but what you you found? In... Yeah, thank you, Professor Kishba. Actually, I do not have the data for our setup, but surprised that even in the US, they do run out of benzathine phenylacetylene. Why? Because it, it needs special storage facilities. I don't, I didn't find any data. Oh, I did look for data for Uganda. But uh, that's what I found that it often uh, is not stocked because it's difficult to store. And then people have to improvise, you know, uh, with other treatments like erythromycin and so on. But the best treatment is benzathine. And therefore, ministries of health and governments should ensure that it is stocked because it's important. It should be prioritized among the drugs. So I don't know if anyone else would like to add on, but that's what I found. Thank you. Yes. Does anybody else want to add on? I think it's a challenge. Um, the time is up, but basically, I think even globally, uh, the development and uh, availability of benzathine penicillin is has been very difficult. The manufacturers are not making it as much as they used to. It's cheap, so I think, as you know, pharmaceuticals, it's not a big priority, but I think people are pushing to look at whether we can get other drugs that may be just as effective. And we hope we can do that. Studies are actually going on. But as you said, benzathine penicillin for the mom is the most important uh, drug currently available. And for children, we need IV um, crystalline penicillin. So I want to bring us to close. It's exactly six o'clock. First of all, I want to thank our panelists. That's amazing. The presentations have been amazing. Excellent presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you for the participation, for our participants. We were up to like 90 participants, so we've lost many, but we thank everybody who's been able to participate. We received many comments and questions, and we'll gather all of these together, and we'll ask our panel to respond to these in writing, so that if you didn't hear or were not able to get the response, we'll have it in writing. The recording of this session, along with additional materials, will be shared. The link to where you'll be able to find this will be posted in the chat right now. We want to thank again our excellent panelists and want to thank everybody for participating. Somebody mentioned the Sub-Saharan African Congenital Anomalies Network. It's on the screen now. That's the link. Um, it's an early and uh, I should say a young network, but we can achieve a lot together. This is particularly for Sub-Saharan Africa, I think other networks in Latin America, Brazil is part of those networks in Southeast Asia, Europe and the US, they have their networks, but this is really our network and we need to really work hard to strengthen and keep it going. I just want to thank everybody for coordinating and Emma, I want to thank you so much for ensuring that the S-scan continues. Thank you everybody and have a good evening. The, webinar is officially over. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.